I remember having a conversation with a colleague about race. It was kind of a joke, but not really. Um, but I said, I hope that no one noticed that I was a woman of color. It was what I had been socialized to do by my family, to make my difference invisible, to navigate and perform to assure the comfort of others so I would be safe, so I could gain proximity to power, and thus secure more opportunity for myself and my family. Sixteen years later, I know that choosing comfort and safety is no longer tenable, a tenable stance when the needs of the world are so great. Every platform, every interaction needs to be a moment of choice, a moment to choose courage to say what needs to be said, what needs to be said now, a moment to choose to include and center the voices of the people who have been unheard, and not just address or help an individual, but to dig into the systems that need to change, to examine the practices that need to be performed differently, to enlarge our understanding of complex social issues by gathering more than a single story, to be brave, choosing courage over comfort every time. So here are some questions I think we should ask ourselves in this moment. If I'm not working toward removing the disparities in health outcomes based on race that were made visible through the pandemic, have I chosen comfort over courage? Likewise, having seen the vital importance of frontline workers, if I am not centering their needs, have I chosen comfort over courage? If I have not engaged in reducing the widening disparities in wealth in our community, have I chosen comfort over courage? If I have not supported equity initiatives to reduce disparities in educational outcomes, have I chosen comfort over courage? And if the image of George Floyd no longer haunts me and drives me to seek race reconciliation in our country, have I chosen comfort over courage? Our day-to-day -day choices are life and death decisions. Although it may not seem like it when we choose to report health data disaggregated by race, or we choose to invest in additional educational programming to compensate for wealth disparities. But truly, truly, this is how high the stakes are. The women who founded SWAN in 1984 were standing on the shoulders of the second wave feminists of the 1970s. Their work was courageous and changed the law and the professional opportunities for women, but not all women. Just like the civil rights movement that came before and took the safer, more ex politically expedient strategy of pushing LGBTQ members out of the forefront of their movement. Similarly, the efforts of the women's liberation movement centered white cisgendered women. When the moment required our predecessors to expand their thinking beyond the single dominant story, they did, they did not seek out those that were invisible and wonder how they could uplift and make them whole. So my challenge to myself and all of us is to find the stories of those marginalized in our community stand in solidarity in their struggle and uplift their message as we move towards a more just society. That is the intersectional feminism we need today. We need to continue to expand the tradition of SWAN, shining a light on the power of women, to include the stories of all women and to highlight the courageous acts that will create a more just, healthy and sustainable community. And I ask that you do this with the fiercest kind of love that all you mama bears, chingonas, women of courage and substance, and badass women know how to do so well. Because, as Martin Luther King said, power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power, at its best, is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice, at its best, is power correcting everything that stands against love. Love hard, 
be courageous, be kind.